Hello, and thanks for joining us for part two of our Ways series at Westside Community Church. Today, we're going to be talking about the sway of they. But before we get into our content for today, I want to just pause to recognize the um, the situation that we're all facing in our world right now. We realize that this is a difficult time for the entire world and that uh, it's it's been difficult and now it's more difficult. And so I want to just uh, acknowledge that along with you to let you know that we are praying for you, that we are seeking God's wisdom and seeking to be people who are loving in this time when love's really been challenged in our world. Um, we're going to be talking today about uh, the sway of they, but I want to I want to just spend a minute looking back just a week and a half ago or so, a little over that, um, to the incident with George Floyd that sparked and continued the spark that had already begun of uh, of unrest, of uh, unbelief, of just really being stunned at the reality of the ugly truth of racism that still exists in our world. And uh, we we see some, some things that happened, and I want to dig into them just a little bit. This could get slightly uncomfortable as I point back to some unpleasant memories, but today I believe we need to understand how bad things that humans do happen and how we could be people who overcome those things. So I just want to uh, dig in for a second to the incident with George Floyd, the tragic loss of his life, um, really, that was, that, was, that was done by Derek Chauvin, the, the cop who, who put his, his knee on uh, George's neck. And what we know is this, that, that Derek's been charged with second degree murder just this week, and that the other three officers that were there with him, they were charged with aiding and abetting second-degree murder. I mean, this was a really, really serious uh, incident for all of them um, and, uh, and tragic in loss. And a CNN article says this. It says, one of the officers, Lane, had been on the police force for four days when Floyd died. According to his attorney, Lane was doing everything he thought that he was supposed to do as a four-day police officer. Lane thought that what he was doing was right because Chauvin refused to turn Floyd on his side after Lane asked if they should. Now, I'm not making any judgments about whether that was an excuse. Uh, obviously, uh, Lane is still uh, accountable for his actions, uh, even though he was influenced by Derek Chauvin. And what I want to point out is that uh, people's actions influence other people. Yeah. Today, we're going to be talking about the sway of they. Where is the world going? Where are people going? And, and, and is that okay? That's one of the questions that we're going to be talking about today. And what I want to, uh, I want to ask this question, why, why does this matter to you and me? And here's why, is because so many people start off on a path, just like Lane, Officer Lane, started off on a path. Never in his wildest imagination would he have ever imagined that he'd be in the situation that he's in. He, 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 he couldn't have imagined that. But when you are influenced by somebody uh, along the way, your direction often changes and, and can even veer off course. And, and so here's a question for all of us to consider deeply today is this, is what are my associations making of me? And is that okay? We're in this series called Ways, Navigating Your Way to Your Best Life. And when I got to be honest with you, when I planned this series, I had no clue what was coming, no clue what was coming. I did not know that one of the most difficult seasons of an already difficult season was going to be thrust upon us. And yet I will go back and say, I think God is so wise as he leads us because what we need right now is wisdom. We're in a book, a series on the book of Proverbs, the, the book of wisdom from the Bible about how to navigate our way through this changing and confusing world. And I believe what we need right now is a heavy dose of God's wisdom and God's love. And what I know also is that uh, people in our lives have a major influence on the direction of our lives. And we need to be aware of that. And I believe that we can take control of that and we can get in front of that and we can be intentional with that so that we can actually influence the outcome of our lives with our association. So today we're going to do this. We're going to talk about one small shift that will make a big difference in our world and in your life. And I'm going to share one warning and one example with you. Now, um, I, I want to just pause also and say that for all of those who are watching or listening who have been deeply affected 
because maybe you've been somebody who's been disenfranchised. Maybe you've been somebody who's been the victim of hate, the victim of racism. I want you to know that I'm sorry on behalf of all uh, those who in this world are so thoughtless so many times. And uh, I want you to know that as a pastor, uh, I felt this, this incredible pressure to say the right things in this season. And I realized that I'm, I'm not going to do that 100% right. I felt the incredible pressure to, to, to do everything right. And I, and I just want to be the first one to raise my hand and say, you know what? I, I'm often the one who's wrong. I'm often the one who doesn't know what to say or how to say it. And I often don't know how to respond in situations like this. But here's what I know. I know that we serve a God who does know and he can offer us grace and he can offer us wisdom and direction. And if you're hurting right now, I want you to know my heart goes out to you. And I believe that Jesus wants something better for this world, don't you? And so we're going to pursue that together. Thanks for listening and watching. Uh, I want to just kind of lighten this up for just a second because we're talking about the sway of they. We're talking about our associations and how they can be so influential in our lives. And so I want to I want to remind you of some stuff that your mom probably said, all right? The first one is this, is birds, and I want you to see if you can finish these sentences, okay? So birds of a feather flock together. Yeah, you knew that one. She probably said that all the time. Here's another one. One bad apple spoils the whole bunch. You got that one. And here's another one. Garbage in, garbage out. We know that. These are things that just reinforce this message that our associations are everything that our associations uh, have an enormous impact on our lives. Uh, I was thinking this week about my uh, high school youth pastor. His name was Steve, Steve Morrow. And uh, if you're watching Steve, I just want you to know I think about you all the time. So thankful to God for you. Steve was one of those guys that made an incredible investment in my life that has paid off so many times over. I just so appreciate Steve. He took us on a trip one time in a bus uh, as a youth group to Mexico from Portland, Oregon. And it wasn't just any ordinary bus. He transformed this thing into the coolest trip bus. This was the coolest road trip bus that you could imagine. I was about 20 students uh, went to Mexico in this bus. We got to take the seats out. We lined the floor with mattresses. And uh, it was just an incredible, probably somewhat illegal trip from Portland to Mexico, but it was memorable. It was amazing. And uh, on that trip, we stopped at Disneyland. You might see some of the paraphernalia in the uh, shot here from this amazing high-res 35 millimeter picture from the old days. But um, this was such a momentous trip for me because I was with some people that were learning things together and it was this intentionally selected group and it was really, really transformative in my life. It was one of those moments, but it was out of a season of time when this guy, Steve, this youth pastor, Steve had pulled together students and he was really intentional about helping us to form our foundation and to form the, the kind of relationships that we would need to succeed. And I'm just forever grateful for that. It made an incredible impact on my life because associations really are everything. I wanted to show you a picture of my friend Russell and I sitting in the seat. I'm, of course, sleeping up against the window. I do want to point out all the hair. Just notice there was a time when I had lots of hair and uh, it went bye-bye. But uh, me and Russell were, were besties in high school, best friends in high school. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Russell a little bit later. Um, but I want you to know that, uh, especially around this time, this season, we've got graduations happening. And I, I have to call out this senior year, this, this graduating class of 2020, I want you to know you guys are the heroes. You're the courageous ones who weathered the storm of coronavirus, who, who are graduating uh, in this weird, crazy season where you didn't have all the advantages. If you could change a few things about this season, I imagine you probably would. Uh, I imagine you would want it to feel a little more normal. You had some some hopes and some expectations that have not been met. But I want you to know that doesn't set you back. You are every bit as equipped to do everything that God has in store for you. And we're, uh, we're very proud of you. In fact, we got to sit down on Zoom this week with Tim, our youth pastor, and some of our graduating seniors. And we got to just spend some time encouraging them. I want you to see what Tim had to say to these guys. Most kids these days, they own their parents' faith, right? It's their parents' faith. So they're going to church uh, with mom and dad. It's their church. It's their faith. And then what happens is they end up graduating from high school. And a lot of times they end up just, you know, they go to college and they don't find a church to go to. They fall out of church. And next thing you know, um, they're not in church any longer. And my, my plea with all of you 
is that when you graduate from, uh, from high school, as you have, hi, Connor, when you graduate from high school and you proceed into your next life, so some of you are going to be going to college, um, not here locally, but you're going to be going to college somewhere around the, the U.S., and my challenge to all of you is that, number one, you will not forget your faith, that you will not forget your faith, and you'll keep God in your life. You know, I'm so proud of Tim. Tim has just demonstrated incredible leadership and care for these students and many more through this season. And uh, I, I want you, Tim, I'm just so proud of you and so thankful for you. Seniors, graduating seniors, I'm so proud of you. We want to say congratulations to you and to the others who weren't on the Zoom call, but that are part of our youth group at Westside. Uh, for those who are connected on a regular basis to our student ministry, we want to call you out real quick. I want to show your names. Uh, we want to say congrats to Skylar Ames, to Danny Arendt. And you know how when they do these graduation ceremonies, um, they always mess up the names. I'm sure that I'm going to. Uh, to Caden Barham, to Dreshawn Eagleton, Annalise Faliano, to Julius Gochez Mitchell, to Caitlin Green, to Lorenzo Hernandez Reyes, to Connor Hebert, to Kenzie Hopkins, Joni Jones, Lindsay Mosher, and Olivia Wooten. We are so proud of you guys. We're cheering for you. We are here for you. We believe in you. And we think that the best is yet to come for you guys. So congratulations. Um, here's what I want you to know. Uh, to the seniors, to everybody else watching, Here's what we need to know today. We need to know this. We need to know that if you walk with the wise, you become wise. But if you associate with fools, you get into trouble. That's the message of Proverbs, which was written by Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, really to his son. And uh, what, what, we, what we see in this verse is when this uses the word walk, that first walk over there, it's really referring to this picture of association, this picture really of actually like uh, a sheepfold. Uh, a flock of sheep. And it's basically saying this is that uh, to walk with somebody is to be a companion of. You're part of the sheepfold with them. And so when you think about walking with wise people, it means you're hanging out with them. It means you're part of the same crew as them. And I want that concept to kind of sink in because it's so important that we be people who understand that our associations make a huge influence in our lives. In fact, here's what I want you to know. Selection determines direction. Your selection determines your direction. In other words, your ability to pick people that are going to be in your inner circle determines your direction, absolutely determines your direction. And so if we're going to get good at being people who thrive in life in this next normal, whatever that looks like, we've got to be able to, to be people of selection, that we pick our crew intentionally. I want to share with you one warning and one example from the Bible real quick. The warning comes from the life of somebody named Rehoboam. This was actually Solomon's son. And Solomon, as you know, was the wisest man who ever lived. He wrote the Proverbs. He wrote them to, he calls it a book to his son. Uh, we don't know for sure if he's talking about this son, Rehoboam. But we do know for sure that Rehoboam didn't read Proverbs, at least not intently, because he uh, really was a fool when it came right down to it. And I'm going to read you... Um, some scripture from 2 Chronicles chapter 10 that describes really just how foolish he was because when Solomon died, uh, the kingdom went to Rehoboam. And here's what he said. He actually went and he asked some advice from some of the older people who'd been around were part of Solomon's crew. And, and it says this, it says in verse 8 of 2 Chronicles 10, but Rehoboam rejected the advice of the older men and instead asked the opinion of the young men who had grown up with him and were now his advisors. I mean, it makes sense. You kind of choose your own cabinet. He said, what is your advice? He asked them. How should I answer these people who want me to lighten the burdens imposed by my father? The young men replied, this is what you should tell those complainers who want a lighter burden. My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. Yes, my father laid heavy burdens on you, but I'm going to make them even heavier. My father beat you with whips, but I will beat you with scorpions. Ooh. <laughs> you know, Rehoboam was cocky. He was inexperienced and he was uh, really a jerk. And it did not bode well for him. The Bible actually records that he did wicked in the sight of the Lord. He was not a good king. He led for 17 years and there was a lot of trouble. And he was driven by two things, pressure and pride. That's what drove Rehoboam, pressure and pride. He was not driven by the right things. Um, he was driven by external forces, things 
out there. He wanted to be somebody. He wanted to please somebody. And those are the things that that drove him. So he goes and he circles up his buddies and he goes, well, what do you guys think I should do? And then they said, be a jerk. And he was like, yeah, that's cool. It's cool to be a jerk then. I'm going to do that. And so you can see his associations influenced his direction and it did not go well for him. And that's a warning to all of us. I, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about my friend Russell. Um, and this is kind of a difficult story to remember because Russell was my best friend in high school. And he was a part of this crew that went to Mexico and his life was changed like mine was. And Russell also went to Africa on a missions trip. And Russell was somebody who was so, so enthusiastic about his relationship with Jesus. And it was contagious. I mean, people around him really caught on to it. As a matter of fact, I was one of those. He really influenced me to be somebody who loved Jesus more and to share my faith with others. And um, what happened was that after high school, though, Russell got kind of connected with some people that really weren't the best influences on his life. And it seemed like everything that he had talked about doing, he started slowly, you know how it happens, just slowly kind of switching directions. And some of the things that he said he would never do, just suddenly they, they started happening in his life. And, and he just really, in many ways, became a different person. And one night uh, in Clackamas, he was in a car with a friend and they were speeding down a side road and he was 22 years old. And they had both been drinking and they were both high and Russell was not wearing his seatbelt. And they went down a hill at a very high speed and they came back up the hill and they hit a telephone pole and the car flipped over and Russell was thrown out and the car landed on top of Russell and he died that night. He was 22. He was my best friend and his life was cut short and he, he didn't remember the lesson of selection. Selection determines direction. He didn't remember the lesson of selection. We've got to remember the lesson of selection. Now, why, why do people run with the wrong crowd? Why do people do that? Why do we do that? Why do we all have this pull to run with the wrong crowd, with people that we know are not going to be a good influence on us? And I think it's this. I think that they, they don't, we don't have a transcendent vision for our lives. We don't have a sense of divine, God-given calling and purpose that, that makes us go like, I got to make sure I stay on track because there's something great that's in store for my life. We have this desire for acceptance that sometimes overrules everything else. We just throw our brains to stop working. We start going like, I just want to be accepted. I just want to be accepted. And sometimes, let's face it, acceptance is easy to get in the wrong crowd, isn't it? All you have to do is go along and you're accepted. And that's a hard, hard thing. If you're a high school graduate right now, if you're a graduating senior, I want you to listen deeply to these words that Solomon's teaching us today, that we've got to learn the lesson of selection. Now, last week we talked about the fear of the Lord. That, that was one of the other five great themes of Proverbs is the fear of the Lord. And what it means is, is that we honor, we revere, we believe God. And so if we do that, we can, meet, we can really be people who live for an audience of one. Rehoboam, he lived for the audience of many. But we want to be people who are willing to live for an audience of one, which would be an audience of saying, first and foremost and most importantly, I want to please bring glory and honor to my creator, God, through Jesus, to be able to live a life that, that really fulfills my potential that he's placed inside of me. So I want to give you some good news now, okay? I want to talk to you about uh, a, a really good example. His name was Barnabas. Barnabas was this incredible New Testament hero of the faith. He was known as the son of encouragement. That's what his name actually meant. He, he was, went around encouraging people. He was such a people person. He was a team player. He liked people and he knew how to put the right group together. And uh, in fact, when no one else would stand up for the apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9 because he had come out of an ugly life. I mean, Barnabas was the only one that would say, hey, look, I think God can change people's hearts and I think he's changed Paul's heart and I think we can trust this guy and I think that we should work with him. And everybody thought he was crazy. But as we know now, look what the apostle Paul accomplished for Jesus. And he wouldn't have done that without the companionship of Barnabas. Influences are incredibly important in our life. So in Acts chapter 11, I just want to read you quickly a scripture from Acts chapter 11 that uh, talks a little bit about this incident that uh, I want to point out. It says this, it says, then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. Both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people 
And then it says, it says it was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. I, I don't know if that uh, makes any sense, but listen, Barnabas knew how to wrangle a crew, a good crew. And, and Paul was the beneficiary of that. And, and because Barnabas did that, he influenced Paul's life and they got to work together. And in fact, they started the movement of Christianity together. How cool is that? I mean, God had such a purpose for those people. Barnabas was not driven by pressure and pride. He was driven by mission and impact. He wanted to make a difference. And he, he wanted to make a difference because he believed that his life mattered. That's so important. Barnabas was a master of selection because he believed there was a strategy and a purpose and a reason and a rhyme to life and that God had something special in store. He had a God-given vision for his life. He, he, by the way, when he went after Paul, did you know that he picked somebody different than himself? He picked someone very different from himself. He picked Paul, formerly known as Saul. He was a murderer of Christians. This guy had a record. He had a past. And Barnabas picked somebody different than himself. And I want to just pause right now in this crazy time that we're in, in our world. Uh, I want to point out that diversity strengthens community. I want to point out that, that sometimes we are totally ignoring the fact that God wants to, to grow us and stretch us as people by helping us to see the unique contribution, the unique perspective, the unique strengths of somebody who's different than us. And that's a calling that God has. Do you know that God loves variety? When God paints a picture of what heaven's going to be like, he paints a picture of diversity. And I love that. And so I want to encourage that in all of us. Can we be people who intentionally seek out those who are different than us to love them, to listen to them, to understand them, to serve them, and to become friends with them? That's a calling that God has on our lives because that's the picture he paints of heaven. And he said, may, may your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I mean, God is literally trying to bring heaven to earth. And part of that is us embracing the idea that people who are different from us strengthen our lives. Now, why don't more people um, run with the right crowd? Why, why don't more people practice the principle of selection? Why is that? And I think I know the answer and I want to point it out. And I think this is the one small shift that could make a big difference in your life. And here it is. People don't believe that their life matters. And so I have just a couple of words to say to you. I want you to know this. I want you to know this. I want you to know that you are worth it. You're worth it. You are worth all the trouble that it takes to assemble the right crew. You're worth the time and the trouble that it takes to get it right. You're worth it. Your life is worth it. You matter so much to God. He talks all through the Bible about how he planned you out he, he, he actually numbered your days. He counted the hairs on your head easier for some people than others. He, he actually mapped out what your days are going to look like. He put in store what you were going to do in those days. He gifted you with certain strengths so that you could do those things. Your life matters so, 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 so much. You are worth it. You deserve to assemble the right crew. You deserve to get the right kind of people around you so that you can pursue God's plan for your life. Now, I want to talk a little bit about what that looks like. Um, and so I want, to, I want to just plant a seed. Here's the thing. Uh, I just mentioned diversity strengthens community. Um, one of the things we see in some of the strongest examples of what this looks like is that we go and we, and we intentionally invite people who are at different stages and from different places and different backgrounds to be kind of part of our crew. And I'm kind of painting a picture of what the Bible would call basically community. <laughs> I've told you over the last number of weeks that I'm, I'm on a mission and it's urgent. I want to see every person watching or listening. I want to see you connected in biblical community. That's what we're describing today. That crew that you have, that is your support system. That's your network. That's your people. It's your tribe. And you've got to have that crew, especially in a time like this. So I want to give you just a couple of things, food for thought, discussion questions that you can take home with you. You can discuss with your family. You can discuss with a group. You could get on Zoom and you could discuss these things. But here's first question. What's your why? What's your why? You know what? Rehoboam didn't know. Barnabas did. What's your why? Why does God have you on this great big planet? 
What does he have in store for you? Have you ever thought about that? Do you have a vision for your life? Do you, do you understand God's purpose for your life? Maybe you, you're just now starting to wrestle with this. And maybe the place for some of us to begin is way back at the beginning to go, wait a minute, I need to accept God's love in order to understand his purpose. I'm going to give you a chance to do that in just a minute. Second question, who's your 10? This is a question we're going to be throwing out a lot at Westside in the next month or two. Who's your 10? Who are the 10 people that you would say are your people? I want to encourage you to get in a group of 10. Maybe that's a growth group at Westside. Maybe that's a serving team at Westside. I want to encourage you to rally a crew if you're not already part of one. If you're a leader, I want to encourage you to find some people. If you're, if you're a person who's going like, I don't know if I want to step out and lead something, I want to just encourage you to connect with some people. Who's your 10? Who are the people that you would say are your support system? And how do you choose them anyways? The, the next question is this, because it's can, can be intimidating to try and go like, oh, get 10 people together. Who's your three? Who are the first three that you would think of? If you, if you had to start making a list of the people that you wanted to be in your crew, uh, I'm so thankful for my youth pastor, Steve. Uh, Russell was an, a, a tremendous influence in my life in the early days. Who are the people that you would pick? I've written mine out. And I actually want to challenge you to get a little piece of paper, a three by five card, your phone. And actually, could you right now start writing out the people. I've, re- I've written mine down, three, three names on this card, and I intend to go after these people. I intend to make sure that we're circled up, that not only am I connected, but that I can invest in them too. They can invest in me, I can invest in them. The people who know how to select the right crew to be around them and who pursue those people, they thrive. They, they win. They make a difference. The people who just let this all happen and end up somewhere in life, Uh, That's exactly what happens. And they're never happy with that direction because it wasn't intentional. It wasn't purposeful. It was accidental. And God has so much more in store for you and me than that. I want to talk to you for a second about this step that I'm asking all of us to take. And that is this spiritual survey. Because we realize that everybody's in a different place spiritually. And our church exists to help people find and follow Jesus. All people to find and follow Jesus. And wherever you are in that spectrum, somewhere along the lines of, uh, maybe I believe in God, but I'm not sure about Jesus. Or maybe, you know, I'm, I'm, I know Jesus as my forgiver, and my leader, and I'm working on what it means to get to know him more. Or maybe it's, you know, I really uh, am digging my faith down deep in, in to God. And I think I'm ready to start sharing that with others. No matter where you're at on that spectrum, I'm going to ask you to take this spiritual survey by texting the word survey to 503-905-9067. And what's going to happen is one of, not only will you take the survey, but one of our, one of our crew is going to reach out and is going to personally pray with you and is going to help you to take your personal next steps in your faith. We believe that your life matters so much. You are worth it and we want to help you grow. Now, if you're here today and you're watching and you're saying to yourself, I just don't know where I stand with God. I want to give you an opportunity to reach up right now to God and to ask him to forgive you of your sins and to give you a vision for your life because he has a vision for your life. So if that's where you're at, I want to ask you right now to just say these words in your heart or out loud, uh, but let God know how you feel. You can tell him this right now. You can say, Jesus, I give you my life. Thank you for saving me. I believe in you, your life, your death on the cross, and your resurrection. Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your spirit. Lead me and teach me to follow you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says if you just prayed that prayer and if you meant it, if you just gave your heart to Jesus, that you're part of his family, you're part of his crew, and he has a plan for you. And we're so excited to help you walk forward in that new life.